In Galatians chapter 5, verses 13 through 26, Paul said, For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Not, only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Now you keep verse 13 in your mind because it is one of those things that legalism is going to throw in your face every single day you talk to one of them. I want to read it again. For you, brethren, have been called to liberty. Only do not use your liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love to serve one another. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, beware lest you be consumed by one another. I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish or desire or want to. But if the spirit leads you, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, Selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, uh, revelies, uh, and the lack of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If you live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another and envying one another. Let's pray. Father, thank you tonight for your word. Be our preacher and our teacher in Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible makes it clear. Paul is so simplistic, he makes it clear that we as believers have been delivered from the curse of the law, Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. We are placed in freedom and liberty and grace, and now we serve God not out of compulsion or threat of punishment, but because we love him. It's just that simple. I, I mean, we have a gratitude and we're thankful for what God's done in my life. So because of, the, because of my thankfulness and because of my passion to serve him, then, then I've been set free. I don't have to serve him because I'm afraid not to. I don't have to serve him because of some compulsion or some threat. Liberty in grace gives us this divine discernment as to what is required in my life and what's required in your life. There is, however, danger, Paul says, and in, in that's how he starts off, verse 13. There's a danger because the flesh is still with us. Okay, now, I mean, all of you know that when God saved you, he left us in this body that that's, has all the same flesh desires, have the same flesh desires you had before you were saved, okay? You need to understand that. Because if you don't understand that, you're going to have confusion and guilt and all that kind of stuff because you have a tendency ever so often to go back to the same hog pen, okay? Now, none of you do, but uh, uh, people like, well, anyhow. I'm, I'm not calling names. I just tell you right to say that. So Paul said there's a danger. The danger is because we live in the flesh, we have a tendency to go back into the law to try to discipline the flesh. You see what he's saying? In order to, in order to, to try to straighten myself up, I give myself a set of rules to live by. Therefore, I can't do this and this and this and this and this, and I have to do this and this and this and this and this. Why? Because if I don't, 
I'll backslide. I'll go backwards. I'll fall from grace. You ever heard people talk about that? Listen, guys, you can't fall from grace if you fell from now to hell and back. Huh? Grace is going with you. God's grace is with you all the time. There's no such thing as falling from grace. Just sounds good, bless God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Uh-huh. So this is true in the case of the Galatian believers. Paul is, is surprised to the legalistic teachers that were Old Testament ordinances, and they had this thing set up. And he said, you worship ordinances and laws and days and commandments. You ever heard that? You ever heard a preacher say that it's a sin to do this on Sunday? Hello? Well, you can't play ball on Sunday. Huh? Amen. Can't go to the grocery store on Sunday. Huh? A- amen. Don't be wet. Don't be going out to the swimming pool on Sunday. Huh? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Why? Because it's the Lord's Day. Guess what? Guess what Saturday is? The Lord's Day. If it's a sin on Sunday, it was a sin on Saturday. Are you listening to me? But that's what legalism will do for you because it gives you a a standard. I'm going to make a statement here that some of you are not going to understand, uh, and some of you probably will. Those of us that have been involved in the drug world and been involved in jail, It is easy for us to live by legalism because we have a standard that we use to keep us straight. And it's hard. A lot of people that that have served 20 years or 25 years in the military, when they get out, they're lost because their life has been regimented every day. They're told where to go, how to do it, and when to do it. And, and then all of a sudden, they, they are out of the military. Nobody's to tell them what to do unless they're married. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> that didn't, I don't know how that got in there. That, I just thought, I just, that slid out. I'm sorry. That just came out. So get, and Paul said, because of the, all that we've just talked about, he said, stand fast. Therefore, in the liberty with which Christ has made us free and don't get entangled again with the yoke of bondage, that is the law. Then in verse 7, he asked a question. Who did, you did run well, that is you were doing awesome until somebody hindered you that you should not obey the truth. Now listen to me carefully. I want you to get this. Because your flesh is not saved, because this body that you and I live in is not saved. Now listen carefully. I want you to get this. No amount of laws and rules and threats can bring this flesh under control. None. You know how it can be under control? Me, you, you. We have to crucify the flesh, Paul said, daily. Amen. You know what that means? That means we have responsibility. I have a responsibility for my own self. Now, it's easier if I don't have responsibility for myself. If it would be a whole lot easier if I could blame my mama, my daddy, the politics, the, my background, the fact that I was poor, lived on out in the country and ate hog, ate, you know, with the hogs and all that kind of thing. That would be good if I could blame all that. But you know who the guy is that's responsible? The guy in the mirror. Huh? Amen. Woo, buddy. When I got there, it changed my life. You know what's so funny? 
Dale and I have talked about it I don't know how many times. When these guys in our program come in there and want to talk to me, they sit out across the desk from me, and I said, tell me what's going on in your life. Guess where they start? Blaming somebody. And I say, time. And they look at me kind of funny. I said, I used all those excuses 50 years ago. So if you don't come up with anything new, I don't have anything to tell you except to go home, look in the mirror. I said, that's your worst enemy. And you know, for some reason, they don't ever ask for a second appointment very often. <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand that. So Paul says this, that because the law is not something that comes from, that is controlled from without, Paul says it has to be controlled from within. He said we need the power from within, and that power comes in the person of the Holy Spirit. There are at least 14 references to the Holy Spirit in the book of Galatians. When we believe in, on Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, Galatians chapter 3 verse 2 says that the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us. We're born after the Spirit. Uh, Galatians chapter 4 verse 29. It's the Holy Spirit of the heart who gives us the assurance of our salvation in Galatians chapter 4 verse 6. And it's the Holy Spirit who enables us to live for Christ and to glorify Him according to Paul's writings in the book of Galatians. The Holy Spirit is not simply a divine influence. The Holy Spirit is a person. The same as God the Father and God the Son are persons, the Holy Spirit is a person. What God the Father planned for you, God the Son purchased for you, and God the Holy Spirit applies to your life when you yield to his convicting power. Something, I think there was a weather thing. On. There's a weather thing right on my sermon note right here. Whew, I must be powerful sermon right here, so I done got interrupted by a, sur- by a weather forecast. I'm going to I'm have to rewrite this, baby. So this verse of scripture that Paul is talking about here, perhaps the most crucial in the entire closing section of the book of Galatians, for it in Paul explains the three ministries of the Holy Spirit that allows us to have the joy and the freedom that God intended for us to have. First of all, he says in verses 13 through 15 that it is the Spirit who enables us to fulfill the law of love. Paul says, For you, brethren, have not been called to liberty only do uh, who have been called to liberty only do not use liberty as an opportunity for the flesh but through love serve one another for all the law is fulfilled in one word even in this you shall love your neighbor as yourself but if you bite and devour one another beware lest you be consumed by one another paul is saying that we are destroying each other by our own greed and our own selfishness. Are you listening to me? There are two extremes that Paul is dealing with here. One extreme is that liberty, grace, gives us the license to sin and to do whatever we want to do without any consequences. The other is seeing this error goes in the opposite direction and imposes the law on everybody. Paul says somewhere in between this extreme and this extreme is the balance in Christian liberty. Throughout Paul's teaching, he, he teaches a word that legalists hate, and that's moderation. That's moderation. So Paul begins by explaining our calling. We're called to liberty. That's a part of our salvation. God gave us 
the child of the living God is a free person, a free man, a free woman. He's free from the guilt of sin because he has experienced God's forgiveness. He's free from the penalty of sin because Christ died for him on the cross. He is free through the Spirit, free from the power of sin in his daily life. He is also free from the law. He's free from its demands, and he's free from the law's threats. Christ bore the curse of the law and ended its tyranny once and for all. We are called to liberty, Paul said. We are called, now watch this, Galatians 1, 6, we are called into the grace of Christ. Grace and liberty go together. Grace and liberty go together. I said it a while ago. You can no more fall from grace than you can fall from your liberty. You understand what I'm saying? And I apologize for the bonehead preachers that teach that you can fall from grace. It is totally, absolutely impossible. You cannot fall from God's grace. Having explained our calling, Paul then issues this caution. Don't allow your liberty to generate, to degenerate into license. This is, of course, fear of people who don't understand the true meaning of grace in the first place. If you do away with the rules and the regulations, they say, well, you create chaos and anarchy. That's not what the Bible teaches. Of course, there is a danger and a very real one, not because of God's grace failing, but because, according to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, because men fail of the grace of God. 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 12 tells us that there is a true grace of God. And if that is true, then there is also a false grace of God. Oops. How can you get a false grace of God? You get it from false teachers. Jude verse 4 says, change the grace of our God into lasciviousness. What does that mean? It means we use God's marvelous grace as a license to sin. That, my friend, is a false grace. So Paul cautions, and his caution is valid. Christian liberty is not a license to sin, but an opportunity to serve. The key to a commandment, verse 13, is by love serve one another. The key word here, of course, is loving. The amazing thing about love is that it takes place of all the laws of God. All these laws, all these laws from the mount, huh? from the stones, all the way through the legalistic Pharisees, the religious folk, they had laws that were so strenuous that you could only walk so far on the Sabbath day and then you had to stop. And if you was just that far from your house and you had already got all your steps in, if you went to your house, you were sinning. You were living, walking in sin. Wow. Well, that must have been a fun life. Don't you know that was exciting? Yeah, I want to follow Jehovah. What's he going? Well, he's going to kill you if you just walk over that ladder right there. That's the way that's going down. But come on down, be a part of our life. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 22, <clears throat> verse 33 through 4, it said, But when the Pharisees, who heard that he had put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them said, who was a lawyer, asked him a question, testing him, trying to catch him in a trap. Saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said to him, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart and your mind and soul and with all. And then it's the first great commandment. The second is, like it, you should love your neighbors yourself. Now, this is what he said. On these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. Take all that you've been taught. Take all that you've been taught from the garden till today. All of it. 
And it comes down to these two things. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love your neighbors yourself. Now listen to me carefully. If you love people because you love Christ, you will love them in spite of them. Did you get that? If you love people because you love Christ, you'll love them in spite of them. I, I, man, listen, I'm telling you, I've been working on a series that it's, that it's so good I almost got saved four times. If I, if I could backslide and be in the Pentecostalism, I, I, could, I, could, man, I could be showing up having a spirit fit. You know what I'm saying? You say, what is Jesus saying? Now listen carefully, I want you to get this. He said, love in the heart is God's substitute for law in the flesh. Did you get that? Love in your heart is God's substitute for the law in the flesh. Secondly, now I'm not to hurry. The Spirit enables us to overcome the flesh. Look at what he said in verses 16 through 24. I say, they walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh... Lust against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another. Now, let me just stop here long enough to, to take your attention over to Romans because Paul said in Romans that things I want to do, I find myself not doing. You remember him saying that? And the things that I, that I don't want to do, I find myself doing. What did he say in the last two verses of that chapter? He said, what shall I say then to this flesh? So what is it that's drawing you to these things that you don't want to do. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which is adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissension, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, rifles, all of these things. You know what all those have to do with? Relationships. Did you get that? Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to tell you this one more time tonight. <laughs> Most of the things that you've heard preached in pulpits that sin is not sin at all. Sin in the eyes of God have to do with relationships. You go to the Old Testament and you find out that there's sin that says that God hates these and then another one thrown in. And when you read that Old Testament scripture, you'll find out that all of those sin that God hates all have to do with relationships. All of this fruit of the flesh, the works of the flesh here have to do with relationships. Envy, jealousy, adultery, fornication, sorcery, envy, murders, on and on and on have to do with relationships. But, he says, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. What are they? All relationships. All of it has to do with relationships. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm telling you on the authority of the Word of God, we will not understand God's importance on our relationship with each other till we get to heaven. It must break the heart of God when he can look and see what's going on in his churches today. The anger and the bitterness and the resentment and the unforgiveness that's going on in our churches today must break the heart of holy God. We ought to be ashamed of ourselves. We ought to be ashamed of ourselves to call ourselves Christian and carry on the way we carry on against each other, against each other. Paul in Romans chapter 7 said, I don't know, I don't know what I'm doing. For what I want to do, I don't do. And what I hate, I end up doing. What to do is not good. And I don't know what to do. No, the evil, I don't want to do. This is what I keep on doing over and over and over again. Paul is not denying that he has victory. 
He's simply putting it in perspective that in my own strength, I can't do it. You understand? Guys, listen. Cliff can't do this. Hmm? Dale can't do this. Daph can't do this. Brian can't do this. Are you listening to me? He can do it through us. He can do it through us. All he wants us to do is to be the channel, the conduit. Now, all you electricians know what conduit is. That's all God wants us to be is just a piece of conduit. He'll take it from there. He will, he will live his life through us. So the solution, Paul said, is not to, put, to pit our will against the flesh, but to surrender our will to him. Wow. Last of all, the Spirit enables us to produce fruit. Verse 22 through 26, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. I want you to notice that that word fruit is singular. They're not fruits of the Spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is like orange. It has sections, but it's still the same orange. The fruit of the Spirit is singular. And in that singular fruit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. All in that one fruit of the Spirit. There's no law against that. There's no law against any of that. There's no law against loving one another. There's no law against joy. There's no law against peace. There's no law against patience or long-suffering. There's no law against kindness. There's no law against goodness. There's no law against faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. There's no law. Those come from the anointing within us. You cannot manufacture it in your own self. It has to come from sovereign God dwelling in you. It's one thing to overcome the flesh and do not evil, but it's quite something else to do good for his glory. The thing about it is, Paul put it this way. If I do all these things, if I sell all of my goods and give to the poor, and I give my body to be burned as an offering and have not love, I'm useless. Wow. Wow. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen. You can come to every Bible study. You can give to every missionary. You can read your Bible from one, from Genesis to Revelation and make sure you write the date down. That way you can tell everybody, look right here, I read through my Bible 16 times. Huh? That's great. That's awesome. Let me tell you something. If you don't live it, you might as well read the funny paper. What Paul is talking about is life in Christ Jesus. Hmm? You know what that will do for you? It will make you love some people that you can't stand to be around. Hello? Amen. I know you know what I'm talking about. I know you know what I'm talking about. In this series we're doing on Sunday morning, we talk about our enemy. And I'm doing a series of sermons that I I really don't know what series it's in. I, I'll just be honest with you. I, I think it's in this covenant series that we're going to do on Wednesday night when we finish that happiness thing. I think that's when it is. And you've heard me say before, 
that preachers are my worst enemy. You ever heard me make that statement? Well, I'm doing that sermon series, and God convicted me that that was a wrong statement. That's an erroneous statement. And I've said it from the pulpit, but it didn't resonate with me until God said it to me. You know, have you ever noticed that? That somebody else can tell you something, and when God says it, it seems to come out different. And I'm working on this sermon, and I talk, and somehow in that sermon, it had to do with enemies. And God spoke to me almost as clear as I'm talking to you tonight, and he said, you don't have any enemies. He said, you only have an enemy. And this is what he told me. He said, people may not like you. And they may talk about you. And they may lie about you. And they may tell things about you that's, that's, that's derogatory and try to tell you down, but they aren't your enemy. He said, you're my, kid. you're my child and you don't have any enemies but one. He said, the problem is if you aren't careful you begin to act like the people that you think are your enemies. That was at 4.15 in the morning. And I closed my computer and I knelt down by a chair and I asked God to forgive me. You see, our focus is out of focus far too many times. If I can focus on Dale, then my focus on him is out of focus. You understand what I'm saying? If I can focus on that family member that's done me wrong, if I can focus on that preacher down there that's called me everything that you could think of but an but a individual, and if I can focus on somebody else, you know what? Then my focus on him is out of focus. And I'm going to tell you something, guys. Sometimes it's no fun getting sermons ready. Are you, are you listening to what I'm saying? Because I'm going to tell you something. God preaches my sermons to me long before I preach them to you. And if I can't get myself right with God, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. I'm going to stumble around and fall around up in that pulpit like a tongue-tied moron. Why? Because I'm trying to preach Clifton's sermon instead of God's sermon. Freedom. God gave us freedom. Because of his grace. Don't abuse it. Use it for his glory. Wow, man, that's good preaching. Doggone.